Worship for Sunday, September the 27th, 2020. Today, Jesus' parable about two sons who don't do what they say reveals surprises in the reign of God. Paul urges us to look to Christ as a model of humility, putting the interests of others above our own. Nourished by worship, we offer our lives for the sake of the needy world. The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weber from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us for worship today. The province has given permission for congregations to gather at 30% of their capacity while maintaining two meter physical distancing. Council met this past week to consider returning to in-person worship and has decided that it is not yet time. Again, in October, Council will reconsider this return. Thank you to our Minister of Music, Katrina Lowe, for recording a prelude and postlude for us again this day. Your music is always a beautiful and important part of our worship at St. Paul's, and we appreciate your gift to us this day. If you need assistance, please phone the church office, and if I don't answer, please leave a message, and I'll arrange for help. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to be together in whatever way possible in this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. The Confession and Forgiveness Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them and keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Children's Time, Orange Shirt Day. I'm so very glad that you're here because I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. So many of us are back at school, if you're doing in-class learning, that is. If you're signed up for distance learning, you may still be waiting. Your parents have had a difficult choice to make about where you will learn this fall during COVID-19. In school where you can see your friends or online, which is safer but more lonely and tricky to do if you don't have enough computers or tablets or enough internet bandwidth. For many years in Canada, First Nations, Métis and Inuit families didn't get to choose where their children would learn. The government made the children go to schools that were far away from their families. These schools were called residential schools because the school students had to sleep or reside there, even if they were only five or six years old. They had to wear uniforms instead of their own clothes, and they weren't allowed to speak the indigenous language that they spoke at home. They were forced to speak only English. They were forced to learn about God and Jesus, even though they already had their own beliefs. Sadly, it was not a good experience for the children. In fact, it was pretty horrible. Did you know that some of the teachers and principals did hurtful things to the students? That's definitely awful. It was much, much worse than having to wear masks and use lots of hand sanitizer at school. I know that you have to stay one to two meters away from your school friends. If you're doing distance learning from home, it's especially hard for you because you probably really miss seeing your friends at school. Did you know that at residential schools, the students couldn't even see their own brothers and sisters who were at the same school? It took Canadians a long time, too long, to realize that residential schools were a bad thing. I'm going to show you a video about a woman named Phyllis she is First Nations, so she had to leave her family and move to a residential school when she was just six years old. Her grandma bought her a special new orange shirt to wear for the first day of school, but the teacher wouldn't let her wear it. Phyllis has told many Canadians about her sad experiences with residential school. Every year on September the 30th, Canadians are encouraged to wear an orange shirt to show our support to Phyllis and the many other Indigenous students who went to residential schools. Watch the video about Phyllis Webstad's story to see the reason it's Orin's Orange Shirt Day. Hello everyone, my name is Phyllis Webstad. I am Shawetmuk from the Strachemuk, Kenu Creek, Khatlitam, Dog Creek First Nation, which is about one and a half hours southwest from Williams Lake, BC. I grew up with my granny on the Dog Creek Reserve until I was 10, then moved with my auntie after she finished university. When I had just turned six, I was sent to the St. Joseph Indian Residential School near Williams Lake, a place we called the Mission. My granny bought me a shiny new orange shirt to go to school in. When I got there, I was stripped, my clothing taken away, including my new orange shirt, and I never saw it again. I was no longer excited to be going to school. I wanted to go home to Granny. I had to stay there for 300 sleeps. No matter how much all of us little kids cried, it didn't matter. 
No one listened to us. Our feelings didn't matter. We didn't matter. I am the third generation that attended residential school. Both my grandmother and mother attended the mission for 10 years each. Today is a day to honor and remember residential school survivors and their families. Every child matters, even if you're an adult. We must also remember those children that never made it and are no longer with us. Today is a day for survivors to tell their stories and for us to listen with open hearts. I am humbled and honored that you are all taking part in Orange Shirt Day. When I was in school, I didn't know my own history, so I am overjoyed that you are taking part and learning the true history of Canada's First Peoples. Gooks Gem, thank you. Like Phyllis said, every child matters, even if you're an adult. I encourage all of you, adults and children, to draw a picture of an orange t-shirt with the slogan, Every Child Matters. You can draw your own shirt, or you can use the template that was attached to the email sent from the church. And if you have an orange shirt, don't forget to wear it on Wednesday, September the 30th for Orange Shirt Day. Now I invite you to move into your favorite prayer posture. It may be hands open, facing up to receive the gift of God's presence in prayer. It may be hands folded and eyes closed to help you concentrate. Or it may be crossing your arms across your chest to form an X, the first letter of Christ in Greek, and it feels like a hug from God. Now let us pray. Dear God, we pray for all students and teachers. Help them to learn in difficult circumstances and keep them safe. We pray for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who were sent away to residential schools and still have bad memories about their awful experiences. Help them to be able to live with their experiences and help us to show kindness to all children, even if they're adults. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Your parents have children's bulletins for you, as well as that t-shirt template that you're welcome to work on at any time, even while you're listening to the sermon. Matthew 21, 23 to 32. A parable of doing God's will. After driving the money changers out of the temple, Jesus begins teaching there. His authority is questioned by the religious leaders who are supposed to be in charge of the temple. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. The first son answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and the second answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you that tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the dominion of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
The sermon. Says who? You're not the boss of me. Jesus had been making the chief priests and religious elders very nervous. These religious leaders were charged by their Roman rulers to keep the peace. As long as things remained peaceful, the Jewish nation would be given a lot of freedom under Roman occupation. But let things get out of hand, and Rome's action would be swift and severe. Jesus was stirring up the people, making the chief priests and the religious elders very nervous. And so they asked Jesus, by what authority is he doing this? Changes in authority never come easily. Consider the United States as they argue about who has the authority to appoint a Supreme Court judge to replace Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Can President Trump make the appointment because he is the president? Or, since it's an election year, should tradition be followed that the next president make the appointment after the people vote and give such authority? Changes in authority never come easily. We live in a time of changing authority, and so did Jesus. We can see that changing authority in today's Gospel reading. In the temple, in their church, Jesus had just violently overturned the tables of the money changers. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus had been recognized by the people to be the Messiah King. Jesus was making the religious leaders very nervous. And so they asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Like kids on a playground taunting, says who? You ain't the boss of me. Changes in authority never come easily. Every 500 years or so, the church goes through a major change in authority. We saw it happen 5,000, we saw it happen a thousand years ago when the church was split into Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic expressions. The division was over the issue of authority. Part of the church chose to follow the authority of the patriarch in Constantinople. The other part of the church chose to follow the authority of the Pope in Rome. We saw that every 500 year change 500 years ago in the Reformation, when the Western church was split into Roman Catholic and Protestant. The split was again over the issue of authority. Would theology continue to be dictated by the Pope or would theology now be grounded in the living word, Jesus Christ? And we see that every 500 year change now as God is bringing about something new once again. A few years ago at St. Paul's, we did an adult education session based on the work of Phyllis Tickle. The study was called Embracing Emergence Christianity. She's the one who recognized this every 500 year shift in authority. And this is what she says about the change in authority that we're currently in the midst of. Emergence is in no way interested in or inclined toward disestablishing the authority of scripture. Rather, emergence is dedicated to freeing that authority from the constrictions of literalness. The Bible is authoritative. But taking the Bible literally is a big mistake, believes emergence, emerging Christianity. Instead of taking the Bible literally, emerging Christianity tends to speak of the Bible as myth, but not in the sense of myth as being falsehood. Our word myth comes from the Latin mythos, meaning a story or set of stories having significant truth or meaning for a particular group. And that significant truth or meaning does not depend upon the story having actually happened. Here's how Phyllis Tickle explains that myth doesn't depend on whether or not the story actually happened. Some 20 years ago now, writes Phyllis Tickle, I was addressing a cathedral gathering on the historicity of the virgin birth. The cathedral young people had served the evening's dinner and were busily scraping plates and doing general cleanup when I began the opening sections of the lecture I had come to give. 
The longer I talked, the more I noticed one youngster, no more than seventeen at the most, scraping more and more slowly, until at last he gave up and took a back seat as part of the audience. When all the talking was done, he hung back until the last of the adults had left. He looked at me tentatively, and gaining courage, finally came up front and said, May I ask you something? Certainly, I said. What about? It's about the virgin birth thing, he said. I don't understand. What don't you understand? I asked, being myself rather curious by now because of his intensity and earnestness. I don't understand, he said, what their problem is. And he gestured toward the empty chairs the adults had just vacated. What do you mean? I asked him. Well, he said, the virgin birth is just so beautiful that it has to be true, whether it happened or not. That one statement from a young emergence teenager, concludes Phyllis Tickle, still stands for me, and always will, as a telling example of emergence Christianity's understanding of Scripture and the nature of its authority. Emerging Christianity values the meaning of Scripture, whether or not the stories in the Bible actually happened. An emphasis on the stories of the faith is one hallmark of emergence Christians, Tickle said. Another hallmark is a sense of spirituality based on Micah 6, 8, which asks, What does the Lord require of you? The verse continues, To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Emerging, emerging Christianity is very incarnational. What we do matters. And isn't that the message of Jesus' parable about the two sons in today's Gospel reading? Which of the two sons did the will of the father, Jesus asked. The religious leaders replied, the first, the one who worked in his father's vineyard. For emerging Christianity, what we do matters. They take seriously Jesus' call to give it all up for me, even to the point of their being hesitant to own real estate. To help them in this radical obedience, Emerging Christians tend to form special communities, such as weekly gatherings in house churches. They're serious about following Jesus in profound and revolutionary ways. As the understanding of the authority of Scripture changes, emerging Christians will be more concerned about Scripture's meaning than whether or not the Bible stories actually happened. Emerging Christians will be incarnational. What we do matters more than what we believe. And emerging Christians will be active participants in intentional communities to support them in their desire to follow Christ radically. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus had been stirring up the people, making the chief priests and religious leaders very nervous. And so they ask Jesus, by what authority is he doing this? Changes in authority never come easily. Every 500 years or so, the church goes through a major change in authority. Now, 500 years after the last change, the Reformation, emerging Christianity is recognizing that the Bible's deep truth and meaning does not depend upon the story actually having happened. As the understanding of the authority of Scripture changes, emerging Christians will focus on what Scripture means for daily living. Changes in authority never come easily, and we can see that every 500-year change now, as God is bringing about something new once again. But in the words of the prophet Isaiah, See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Once again, God says, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Even though times are changing and the future is largely unknown, 
we go into a future that has been prepared by our God. And so the future is good. Thanks be to God. Amen. Prayers today have been prepared by Pastor Rick Price of Lunenburg Lutheran Parish in Nova Scotia, and we thank him for his gift to us. We offer our prayers to God, trusting that we will be heard and trusting that we'll, we, we will be changed to hear God. God who is faithful, you provide, you accompany, you forgive, you sustain we offer our grateful thanks. God who is with us, hear our prayer. God who is faithful, we are so easily distracted from your goodness and love. Remind us again that you walk with us in our wilderness. God who is with us, hear our prayer. God who is faithful, you call us to reflect your graciousness with the people around us in situations which can be especially challenging. Give us faith in your faithfulness. God who is with us, hear our prayer. God who is faithful, you send your church into the wilderness of daily life. Build up this gathering of believers that we may support each other on the journey we take. God who is with us, hear our prayer. God, who is faithful, you travel with us on the most difficult roads. Continue to guide those who are sick, isolated, and without hope, especially those we remember before you now. God, who is with us, hear our prayer. God, who is faithful, we give you thanks for your faithfulness. Enable us to reflect your love always. God, who is with us, hear our prayer. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace. Receive the blessing. Mother in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.